Welcome back to another episode of Daily Neville. I am your host, Josiah Brandt. Daily Neville is all about breaking down the teachings of Neville Goddard, making them easy to understand, easy to digest, easy to apply in 20 minutes or less. Today we're continuing with Neville's famous 1942 book, Freedom for All, and it has been quite an exploration. We've now had several episodes of this series and they just keep getting better. In today's episode, we're going to explore how desire is the word of God and connect those two ideas as presented in the scriptures, desire and, and as, the word of God. Let's go ahead and dive right in. Desire, the word of God. So shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth. It shall not return unto me void, but it shall accomplish that which I please, and it shall prosper in the thing whereunto I sent it. God speaks to you through the medium of your basic desires. Your basic desires are words of promise or prophecies that contain within themselves both the plan and power of expression. By basic desire is meant your real objective. Secondary desires deal with the manner of realization. God, your I am, speaks to you the conditioned conscious state through your basic desires. Secondary desires, or the ways of expression, are secrets of your I am, the all-wise Father. Your Father, I am, reveals the first and the last. I am the beginning and the end. But never does he reveal the middle or the secret of his ways. That is, the first that is revealed is the word, your basic desire, and the last is its fulfillment, the word made flesh. The second or middle, which is the plan of unfoldment, is never revealed to man, but remains forever your father's secret. We're going to go ahead and start right there. This is quite a layered explanation of what's going on here. So he starts off by, by quoting this scripture that says, my word that goes forth out of my mouth will not return unto me void. Basically what that means is that that which we project out into the external world in the form of our thoughts and feelings, which is electricity and magnetism, thoughts and feelings, that will be returned back to us, not void, meaning it won't be meaningless. It will have some sort of meaning, meaning that our thoughts and our feelings are creative and they plant in the fertile soil of our reality. And they don't turn up nothing. They don't turn up dead. They do bear fruit. Our thoughts and our feelings bear fruit. And this is a sacred principle of the Father, which is I am. It's the sacred principle of consciousness itself. And it's, again, revealed to us in these mystic scriptures of the Bible. Neville also draws upon the I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. But no mention is given of the middle, meaning that the beginning is your desire, the end is the fulfillment of the desire, and the middle is, well, the Father in me has ways that I know not of. Meaning that you and I do not need to concern ourselves with how our basic desire will be realized. That's the miracle of consciousness. That's the quantum field at work. There are entanglements. There are ways and means that the Father knows of, or that consciousness itself knows of, that you and I in our limited human form do not need to know of personally. Continuing with Neville's words, he says, For I testify unto every man that heareth the words of prophecy in this book, if any man shall add unto these things, God shall add unto him the plagues that are written in this book. And if any man shall take away from the words of this book, of this prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book of life. Now, this, of course, is a quote from the book of Revelation. And a lot of people have taken it to mean that you should not add or take away from the Bible. But we understand in the mystic interpretation that it's deeper than that surface level interpretation. And Neville is going to reveal right now and some insights into what it truly means. Neville continues, The words of prophecy spoken of in the book of Revelation are your basic desires, which must not be further conditioned. Man is constantly adding to and taking away from these words, adding to and taking away from these basic desires. Not knowing that the basic desire contains the plan and power of expression, man is always compromising and complicating his desires. Here's an illustration of what man does to the word of prophecy, which is his desires. 
Man desires freedom from his limitation or problem. The first thing he does after he defines his objective is to condition it upon something else. He begins to speculate on the manner of acquiring it. Not knowing that the thing desired has a way of expression all its own, he starts planning how he is going to get it, thereby adding to the word of God. Now, this is a very human thing to do. It is very human to think of something that we want and then begin to speculate or strategize on how to get it. It's a very left brain, logical, human thing to do. But with this sacred knowledge of the mystic, we can understand that this is not the recipe. This is not the formulaic in, lay, as in the terms laid out in consciousness itself. This is not the way to go about it per se. This also is not really a black and white thing. You can become aware of how to do it, but you should not speculate on how to do it. It should be revealed to you, right? So the father within you needs to reveal to you the, the ways and means and to carry it out through a bridge of incidents rather than you trying to force it to be done. So it's up to you to move the energy first before you lift a finger. Neville continues, if on the other hand, this man has no plan or conception as to the fulfillment of his desire, then he compromises his desire by modifying it. He feels that he will, if he will be satisfied with less than his basic desire, then he might have a better chance of realizing it. So this is when you dream what seems to be too big. You're like, oh, what I, what my heart really wants is X, but that's probably a little much. I would settle for Y. Individuals and nations alike are constantly violating the law of their basic desire by plotting and planning the realization of their ambitions. They thereby add to the word of prophecy or they compromise with their ideals, thus taking from the word of God. The inevitable result is death and plagues or failure and frustration as promised for such violations. Now let's think about this in a logical way. Death and plagues are two other words for failure and frustration. So death kills you, which would be a failure of life. Plagues frustrate you because they're painful and, you know, take time and energy and, you know, they're frustrating. So it makes sense that the scriptures worded in this way would predict that if you add to the desire by trying to determine the how or take from by compromising, you'll experience failure and frustration because you're not operating in accordance with the law of consciousness. And that's what this passage is communicating. Neville continues, God speaks to man only through the medium of his basic desires. Your desires are determined by your conception of yourself. Of themselves, your desires are neither good nor evil. I know and I am persuaded by the Lord Christ Jesus that there is nothing unclean of itself, but to him that seeth anything to be unclean, to him it is unclean. Your desires are the natural and automatic result of your present conception of yourself. God, your unconditioned consciousness, is impersonal and no respecter of persons. Your unconditioned consciousness, God, gives to your conditioned consciousness, which is man or the person that you believe that you are right now, through the medium of your basic desires, that which your conditioned states, so that's the part that you're playing, your present conception of yourself believes it needs. I want to go back to this verse that he quotes here. I know and I am persuaded by the Lord Christ Jesus that there is nothing unclean in and of itself, but to him that seeth anything to be unclean, to him it is unclean. So there is no desire that is good or bad in and of itself. It is only our judgment of it as one or the other that makes it so. And this is also why I found on this path, it's important to take responsibility for your own judgments of states. Meaning that to you, if you choose to diet in some way, and I don't just mean in food, if you choose to diet in any way, that could be what you think about, the people you spend time with, uh, what you eat or don't eat, uh, the things you do or don't do, and that could that's a very broad interpretation. If you do any of those things, because to you, to do that, thing or to not do that thing would be unclean, then in truth, according to the law of consciousness, for you, yes, there would be consequences if you were to do or not do that thing, because to you, it is unclean. But you need to take responsibility for your, for that, for that understanding and say that it is for you unclean. It says nothing about projecting that onto others. 
And I know it's also a very human thing to take one own, one's own personal preferences as to what is clean and unclean and then project them onto others and tell others how they should diet or not diet. And again, by diet, I don't just mean food. I really mean anything. To say to others, you should do this or not do this because it's clean or unclean. That is really a projection. And according to the law of consciousness, what's true for you isn't necessarily true for another. Meaning that if it's unclean to you, it's unclean to you. And you need to take ownership of that rather than projecting it onto someone else. Continuing with Neville's words, he says, as long as you remain in your present conscious state, so long will you continue desiring that which you now desire. Change your conception of yourself and you will automatically change the nature of your desires. Now, I believe all of us can relate to what he is saying here. I can think of times that the younger version of myself desired something that today I no longer desire. There's a version of myself that wanted certain things and thought that those things were all important. And then I outgrew them. That's literally what Neville is saying right here. Your present conception of, of yourself believes that it wants certain things. But if you were to change your state, your desires would change also. The things that I desire now for my life are very different than what I used to desire back in my younger, in terms of, of a spiritual journey, desires were. I would say in many ways, my desires have matured. And now I'm focused on the expression of my maximum highest potential, as opposed to temporary or artificial or superficial pleasures. Continuing with Neville's words, he says, desires are states of consciousness seeking embodiment. They are formed by man's consciousness and can easily be expressed by the man who has conceived them. How do we do this? How do we express the desires after we have conceived them? Well, Neville says, desires are expressed when the man who has conceived them assumes the attitude of mind that would be his if the states were already expressed. This is the foundation of, of Neville's teaching over the decades, where he says, don't think of the state, think from the state. Don't think of, I wish I were a wealthy person. Think from the state of wealth. I am now a wealthy person. And allow your mind, your thoughts, and your concept of yourself to align with that state. And that's how we express the desire, because we assume the attitude of mind that is perfectly natural to the state that is aligned with having our desire. Neville continues, he says, because desires, regardless of their nature, can be so easily expressed by fixed attitudes of mind, a word of warning must be given to those who have not yet realized the oneness in life and who do not know the fundamental truth that consciousness is God, the one and only reality. This warning was given to man in the famous golden rule, do unto others that which you would have them do unto you. The golden rule. Neville has long said in his teachings that there really is only one rule that governs the use of the law of consciousness. And that is, of course, the golden rule. When you understand that there is no other, all others are aspects of your own self. And that when you hurt another, you are hurting yourself. And when you love another, you are loving yourself. When you help another, you are helping yourself. When you give to another, you are giving to yourself. When you comprehend the oneness that is life, the golden rule is the most logical, fundamental law and, well, rule, right? Guide for behavior imaginable. It makes all the sense in the world. If there's any question about this, this is why Neville's giving the warning. You can very easily manifest using your mind. But you should only do so in a way that honors others in the same way that you yourself would like to be honored. Continuing with Neville's words, he says, you may desire something for yourself or you may desire something for another. If your desire concerns any other, make sure that the thing desired is acceptable to that other. 
The reason for this warning is that your consciousness is God, the giver of all gifts. Therefore, that which you feel and believe to be true of another is a gift you have given him. The gift that is not accepted returns to the giver. Be very sure then that you would love to possess the gift you are giving to another. For if you fix your belief within yourself as true of another, and he does not accept this state as true of himself, this unaccepted gift will embody itself within your world. Always hear and accept as true of others that which you would desire for yourself. In doing this, you are building heaven on earth. And Neville just revealed to us the sacred secret of how to build heaven on earth. And it is, of course, being God, the giver of all gifts, and choosing to give gifts according to the golden rule. Lovely gifts. Imagining and envisioning ourselves and others in lovely states. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you is based upon this changeless law of consciousness. Only accept such states as true of others that you would willingly accept as true of yourself, that you may constantly create heaven on earth. Your heaven is defined by the state of consciousness in which you live. Which state is made up of all that you accept as true of yourself and true of others? Your immediate environment is defined by your own conception of yourself plus your convictions regarding others which have not been accepted by them. Your conception of another, which is not his conception of himself, is a gift returned to you. And we're going to leave it there for this episode of Daily Neville, revealing the law of consciousness, desire as the word of God, and of course, the only rule that truly matters, the golden rule, which is how we create heaven on earth. Thank you for joining me for this episode of Daily Neville. And until the next, imagine wisely, my friends, and I will see you again very soon.